happen. Okay, while we're rolling, let's move on to another example here. I want to set up a hand now to explain some more about pod odds and implied odds. Here's a situation where, let's take a look at what you got. Six, seven of hearts. Now, we're playing small ball, so you know what we do with these kind of hands, right? Small ball baby, 500. Exactly, nice. So let's say everybody folds around now to the big blind. And the big blind decides, yeah, he's going to call you. So he throws out 300 more, OK? Pot's going to come in. Now we got a flop. OK, now the flop comes down, king, eight, four. You don't have anything but seven high, all right? Now let's say your big blind opponent decides that he's going to bet out, and he bets 500. So let's throw that out there. OK, now without me helping you, what are you going to do here in this spot? Gut shot, I'd probably throw it away. You know, that's what I would advise for a beginner, because I don't want them playing these slim kind of draws. There's a nice size pot here. You could call, and if you snag that gut shot five, you have a chance to get implied odds. By that, I mean you could win all the rest of his chips. In this situation, I would go ahead and make the call one time, because if you hit that five, the payoff is huge. And you know, what we're doing with small ball, it's like fishing. We're, we're taking little risks, throwing out a little bit of bait, but we're looking to catch the real big sucker. So I'm taking into consideration what I could win down the road. Exactly, and that's called implied odds. So in this lesson, we learned two things. One, implied odds, you can take long shots if your payday is going to be big enough. The other thing we learned is that sometimes the pot is laying you such a big price that even if you know your opponent has a better hand than you do, it's still correct to call. Make sense? It makes sense. You know, here's the thing with small ball, though. It only works if you have the patience, discipline, and know-how to avoid the big traps. Okay, so let's look at an example right away here. Here was a situation where you were on the button with an ace-8. We know, playing small ball, nobody's in, you're going to go ahead and attack those blinds. So you went ahead and made it 500, the big blind called. Now the flop comes, king-8-6. He checks to you. You've got a decent hand here. You've got middle pair and an ace-over card. So in this spot, I mean, what would you do here? Considering the pot, I bet 700. Excellent. I like the bet size. There's a little over 1,000 in there. Your 700 chip bet here is going to send the message to your opponent that, hey, I mean business. And here comes your opponent, and he sticks it all in. Oh, that's tough. That is tough. But here's a situation where he's risking all of his chips. You just threw out 700. You're going to protect all yours. You're going to avoid this trap right here. He doesn't even know if you've got three eights, maybe a, a set of kings or something that strong. He's risking all his chips here, but you know what? We're going to avoid the trap. Here you're just going to give up your 700 and dump this hand. That's the key to small ball. This is a situation where you had a decent hand, but you got a lot of resistance from your opponent. He's risking all those chips on this one hand. You, you've only lost a little bit, but you protected everything that's in front of you. I promise you, what you got to do here is you got to keep the faith and continue with the system, and in the end, it's all going to work out. In this lesson, Daniel showed me the importance of avoiding traps. It's good to keep jabbing and to be in a lot of pots, but when somebody raises and I don't have the nuts, it's best just to fold the hand and save my money for when I do. When you're playing small ball, it's no good unless you're avoiding traps. When I talked to him about that, he seemed to get a really good understanding of that, so I have faith that he's going to use it properly. You know, probably the best thing about small ball is something I want to talk about right now. When it comes to setting traps, it's just so easy. You're playing so many hands, you're always throwing jabs, you're confusing everybody. When you have the nuts, or when you have nothing, they're not really sure because you play them the same way. That's the key. Why don't we look at an example where you actually have a good hand. You've raised on the button here with the ace-jack of hearts. The big blinds called you, and now the flop comes gin. You flop the absolute nut flush. Now, in this spot, the big blind here decides to check it to you. Now, what's your play? Uh, let's keep it consistent. I'll bet 700. Excellent. See, this is actually setting a trap. If you would have checked here, that's going to set off alarm bells. This guy knows you always bet. You're always being aggressive. If you check, he's going to think, hmm, you must have a really good hand. And the amount you bet is perfectly in line with small ball. You've got 1,000 over there, and you're betting 700. You do that when you have the nuts, and you also do that when you're bluffing. So in this spot, if your opponent is unlucky enough to have a decent hand, he's not going to know what to do. Let's have a look. Here he comes. 
all the chips. Now he's risking all that. You've risked only 700. You obviously are going to call him, and you're going to bust this guy right here. Turn over his hand and see that, look, he's got top pair, a pair of queens. Against you, he's never going to throw that away. He thinks he's protecting his hand because you're playing what looks like maniac style. So here's the thing. When he makes this all-in play and you don't have anything, you lose the 700. But when you actually do have a hand, he loses everything and you bust him. So this hand worked out perfectly. You set a trap just by sticking with small ball. I promise you, if you continue to have the faith in the system, it's going to work out real well for you in the end. Okay, it's time to take some of the stuff we learned and really put it into practice. There's this one really cool play that all the pros know, but you never really read about it in books or anything like that. It's uh, what I like to call phantom poker or calling with nothing. All right, let's look at an example here. Uh, let's say here you're in the big blind, you've got small blind, big blind, with 25 and 50 chip blinds. Small blind says, okay, he's going to raise you to make it 150. Let's see what you got. Nine ton of hearts. Okay, this is a nice little hand here. You're going to go ahead and call, right? I think I'll call. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to go to a flop. Flop comes down. We got an ace, six, and a four. Now, this doesn't help you at all, right? No, it doesn't. One thing is, though, you got position in this situation. Let's say again, the small blind who raised before the flop throws out another 150. Go ahead and call. Are you serious? Trust me. Go ahead and call. Okay. All right. Now, here we go to the turn. Let's say your opponent checks now. It's all up to you. He's basically putting up the white flag, saying, you know what, you've, you've called on this flop, he's going to give you credit for something. If he doesn't have anything here, he's saying, go ahead and take the pot right here and now. So how much am I betting? You know what, we're going to stick with that whole small ball theme we were talking about earlier. There's about 600 in chips in that pot, right? Well, we don't need to bet the whole 600 to get the information we need. Why don't we try something around half the pot, maybe uh, 400? 400 it is. So you bet this 400 right now. If your opponent doesn't have an ace, you call this flop, it looks like you either have an ace, you might have a four, he's just going to give up. You've won this pot with pure position. He mucks his hand, you take it down, you don't tell anybody, you had absolutely nothing with the nine ten of hearts. The whole theme behind this idea, it's calling with nothing. Now this is a play, in combination with all those other plays, it's really going to take you to the top. You know, I really think I surprised Cole with that one tip, calling with nothing. Um, when I told him to call, he kind of looked at me funny like, are you serious? I, he, I mean, he thought I was joking. But I think that tip, that one secret tip that the pros know, is the one thing he might have been missing that's going to put him over the top. Okay, Cole, you know what's going to really separate you from the middle of the pack? The way you defend your blinds. You're going to be a very liberal blind defender. You're going to defend with all kinds of hands because you want the image of a guy that says, you know what, you're coming to get my blind, big trouble, buddy, I'm coming with you. Let's say, for example, the blinds are 100, 200, and an opponent has made it 600. Well, you've only got to call 400 more. So you get 400 in that pot to win 2, 1, and 4. So you're getting odds of 7 to 4. There's not that many hands in Hold'em that are a bigger underdog than 7 to 4. So I know a lot of the books say, you know, you want to play trash hands in the big blind, but you're a good player. You want to see flops. You want that image of an aggressive blind defender. And you know what? The key, though, after the flop is you don't want to get too caught up with these hands. If you call a raise with a, I don't know, a 6-4, if the flop comes king, queen, jack, I mean, don't just go bluffing at it. You're the good player looking to hit hands against other people and just have them scared of you. So how does that image strike you? That sounds great. Don't you hate it when a guy just keeps defending his blinds and is real pesky and never leaves you alone? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's exactly the kind of guy I want you to be. Sounds great. In this lesson, Daniel stressed to me the importance of defending my blind. There's always these pesty players that will re-raise you when you try to steal their blinds, and he showed me how to be the pest. You know, my goal with Cole was really to make him sort of a, an uh, imposing monster. And one of the things I wanted him to do was really defend his blind liberally, so that when people came after him, they'd have to think twice about stealing his blind.